Well, hate speech laws in Ireland have been enforced in apocalyptic ways. Uh, the fact that they exist in this way in the first place is terrifying enough. Politicians are warning it will get worse because they can't handle anyone being uncomfortable. This is a great example of multi-stakeholder uh, law enforcement. We spoke about this yesterday when we spoke about the new UNESCO uh, internet censorship. So we have an expert here from Ireland to break it down. Ivor Cummings is joining us. He's a biochemical engineer and a corporate complex problem solving expert. He does a great job on his YouTube channel, on his Twitter channel. You can look for it yourself by just putting in his name. Um, a lot of times, you know, what I appreciate, I just want to say thank you for coming. One of the things I appreciate about the way you break down these problems is you're trying to address the fact that it seems crazy. People are talking about it as if it's crazy, but we're living it now. So can you just tell us what are these hate speech laws in Ireland? How did we get here? Yeah, thanks a lot, Natalie. Well, it's an extraordinary story because we have hate speech laws that have served excellently well since the 80s. And they've been used, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 times is my understanding. And they specifically uh, get you, if you will, uh, for inciting hatred, inciting violence against minorities, whatever. And they work perfectly well. But recently, uh, I've often said Ireland is kind of a subsidiary of uh, Big Pharma, or nowadays the WEF. We're kind of a slave nation. So all of our politicians over many decades have increasingly uh, run off to Brussels in the EU, the European Union, and they're clearly taking their orders mostly from above. And that's where this is coming from, of course. So the new law is astonishing. Most people have not actually read the draft of the law and I have, and even I was stunned. And it's hard to be stunned after the last few years with the COVID madness, clearly. But I must say I was stunned. So just in short, a couple of things. They actually now have around eight to 10 kind of protected groups, if you will. It's just written down by the government and it includes transgender kind of stuff. And of course, racial stuff and the traveling community a kind of a gypsy type community in Ireland, etc. If you have anything in your possession, anywhere, computer, phone, written, in your possession, it only takes one policeman now, not the commissioner like before, the commissioner had to get a warrant. Now one policeman, if he gets a report, doesn't like you, whatever, they can come to your house, demand all of your equipment, anything they want, search your house on the word of one policeman. It's astonishing. If they have anything with a pin code, it is also written as an offense to not supply the pin code. Wow. So this is guilty until proven innocent. It's yes. quite astonishing. And so could that include, let's say, the, the little boy in Massachusetts who was in trouble for wearing a t-shirt that said there are only two genders? Um, so anything that you're displaying outwardly would also be an offense, do you think? Well, right now they would claim that, oh, no, 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 that's that's not uh, inciting, you know, potential harm uh, to someone particularly. But the whole thing about this is you do not need to actually share the material for it to be a crime. So it's literally minority report, it's thought crime. If you have any material in, in your possession that could cause you know, harm to a minority group, they only have to have a judge say that you would have probably or intended to share it and to incite you know, anger or something. You don't need to actually share it. So that's the most shocking thing of all, thought crime. But if you just had something saying there are two genders, I guess you could argue this law could not be used. It's not offensive enough. It wouldn't be in the spirit of the nonsense law. Okay. Now, recently, Green Party Senator Pauline O'Reilly spoke. She said, we are restricting freedoms, but for the common good. And I guess she thought that was an okay thing to say. This was from 2022, and it's now gone viral to explain what's happening there. So why did she think that was an acceptable thing to say? Is that the appetite in Ireland? It's the appetite in the political and the elites and the NGOs and the neo-Marxist leftist movement, and I could go on all day. We have got a major problem. 
we've got a cancer throughout our leadership, essentially. I can't put it any other way. So yes, there's a belief there. And I remember Hoover, I can't remember the exact quote, but he said that the whole safety and it's an emergency, a thing, has been the tool of demagogues uh, forever, all the way back to the Roman Empire. And this is exactly what it is. It's a chilling effect. It's the taking away of your constitutional right to express yourself, free speech, taking it all in the way, it, away in the name of safety. Now in COVID, they took it away on the back of saving granny, which we knew was nonsense because the behaviors and responses uh, had no real effect on the actual mortalities that occurred. That's published widely. Here it's the notional or purported safety of a whole bunch of different groups who are not in any particular danger at all. So there's no basis whatsoever. And even if there was a basis, the existing hate laws for incitement to hatred and violence are perfectly adequate to be used for this purpose. The one I've described is clearly insane. It's fundamentally unconstitutional in its writing, in its drafting, all the way through. It's quite insane. Now, people may say, well, Ireland is just a crazy place right now. They'll vote them out. That won't spread to other countries. But Ireland was the one of the first to institute gender self-ID laws where you could just go and say you're a woman if you're not a woman and get all your documents changed with little to no bureaucracy. Um, and that absolutely did spread. So are you saying then that Ireland is sort of a test bed for these um, types of policies and then we need to pay attention because they will and do spread? Yeah, essentially, like, like I said at the start, I used to joke many years before COVID because I worked in metabolic health and pharmaceutical kind of uh, intrigues and controversies. And I used to always say we're a subsidiary of big pharma. And now the, the modern day equivalent is we're a subsidiary of WEFUN, EU. So basically the Irish, perhaps due to the seven or 800 years under British rule, there's a tendency to kowtow and bow to the big guys. So we had a lot of that over the centuries uh, in the leadership. And now we're seeing it again. Yes, we're effectively de facto a test case because our guys running Ireland don't report to the electorate anymore, it appears. They report straight up to the UN, WF, EU. It's all the same thing. And as a result, they're running over each other to bring in fundamentally unconstitutional insanity on behalf of the paymasters, the lords, the new feudal lords. And as a result, we, we effectively are becoming a test case. Yes. Yeah, so it's really important that people wake up to the madness and you can get the legislation. I talked to a professor actually who agreed with me on COVID, an Irish professor. And then when I told him about the hate speech law, he said, ah, come on now, the way you're describing that, that's kind of conspiracy. And I said, okay, then. And I WhatsApped him a link. I said, you read it and you tell me. And he came back, quite frankly, in shock. And he he just could not believe what he had read. Right. Well, now we see it being enforced with Conor McGregor, the MMA fighter, or uh, yes, it's UFC fighter. Sorry. He's some kind of fighter contact sport uh, who's being punished for um, what he said about the riots this weekend. Can you tell that story quickly? Yeah, well, I know he said he made a, a kind of intriguing comment without saying specific stuff. He said, Ireland is at war. And I guess the inference was, you know, against the, the leaders up top. Uh, but he also made a few more comments. I'm not sure exactly what, but he generally was kind of attacking the leftist or the political elite that have caused this problem. And that's very important for people to understand. I noticed many, many years ago that there was an excessive migration policy that didn't make sense really for humanitarian reasons. When I was a kid, we had the Vietnam boat people during the Vietnam War. We welcomed them with open arms, but they were scattered around and accommodation was found and it all fitted beautifully and it was a great thing to do. But the last few years, and specifically in the last year or two with the Ukraine war, they've actually brought in, I think, nearly 200,000 people into a country of around 5 million. Uh, we already have a massive housing problem for our own uh, current occupants, including migrants. 
and there's nowhere for them to stay. So recently in Ireland, they cancelled the building of a nursing home, a care home in a small community in the southeast of Ireland, and they've changed it to a place for a few hundred young male unmarried migrants who came over in the last year. So we were told, of course, Ukraine, women and children, safety, great stuff, we're all behind it. What we got was a massive proportion of young male, uh, not from Ukraine, from Georgia, Congo, all over the world. They sent out last year an invite basically saying, you'll have a house within four months, you'll have great you know, payments. And they put it in various African languages and Georgian and Ukrainian, in fairness. But they put that out last year. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, something you said in a speech recently was that the purpose of this is to flood borders in order to make a global government. So there is no longer any national ID in any one place. Um, you know, my husband and I, we were talking about recently this unhelpful conversation online of who's the most oppressed group. Is it Jews? Is it Arabs? Is it black people? I, I hate this conversation, but my husband says, well, what about the Irish? Like they're just left out of this conversation despite a really tough history. We don't treat them like that anymore because I don't know why, because the skin's too light or because they're part of the UK or, or whatever. Um, so it's almost as if the story of an oppressed group is no longer important when you're saying we'd like to protect our borders. Like the conversation is not valid. Do you see what I mean where I'm going with this? Oh, absolutely. So the destruction of common sense and logic is the first weapon of the neo-Marxists. And sadly, we have a useful idiot army of these kind of communisto types ideologues. Uh, our society is riddled, our university is riddled, and therefore they're corrupting the youth as well. I have five children and they report back to me the nonsense that's being talked that makes oh, no yeah. sense. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's, it's a major problem. So they've moved the Overton window to a to place where you can't make salient, logical, coherent points to have a discussion. So last night on RTE, we had gripped.ie, G-R-I-P-T.ie is the only news service in Ireland that actually provides real news. And their leader was on and he was attacked all around by the presenter and the panel about this recent riots problem. And he was amazing. But he basically said that we are no, we are telling us we are no longer allowed to report the truth. We are no longer allowed to have open, frank discussions. And it, quite frankly, it's insane. Right. Well, you know, throughout Europe now, there is an appetite to vote out leftist leaders. Uh, Ireland has plenty of normal thinkers or even brave thinkers, uh, Mick Wallace, Claire Daly, but they don't, they're European MPs. Uh, they're not elected to run Ireland. So do you think there will be an appetite for common sense, peace loving politicians, uh, and there will be a come up in soon? There is a growing movement. The only realistic one I see, and they've just launched is independent Ireland. And I think they're on Twitter, but they're only beginning. They have a couple of members of parliament, and I believe they have a couple of score of uh, councillors. So they're growing, and I think they're going to attract a lot of attention for the reasons you just said, Natalie. Uh, we also have the Farmers Alliance, but they're more to defend the farmers against the kind of climate madness. So this independent Ireland is trying to pull together independent members of parliament and councillors and give people an alternative. The sad thing is Fine Gael, Fianna Foil, and indeed Sinn Féin, the kind of workers' party of the Irish struggle of decades ago, uh, they're all uh, banging from the same drum, hymn sheet. They're all supporting COVID madness. They're all supporting this current madness we're discussing. So mo the three main parties, uh, it appears, forget about it. So we need independence coming up and we need people to go out there and start supporting them. And we need it ASAP. Yeah, I understand. Uh, we have the same situation in the United States. Uh, two separate parties ideologically opposed, but united about war. So thank you so much for uh, joining me. I really appreciate your channel. I hope we can talk again another time. Thanks so much, Natalie. Delighted.
Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.